So what I'd like to do today is actually speak um, to the title um, that uh, Father Gregory mentioned, but also perhaps tweak it at the same time. Because <laughs> in doing the paper, I actually realized, in writing the paper for you, I, I realized that um, empathy was becoming more and more the theme. And so in, in, the, in the, the dialogue section between Aquinas' understanding of friendship and flourishing, um, I was originally thinking of including from the psychological sciences uh, attachment theory, um, theory of the theory of forgiveness as a technique in, in therapy, um, as well as in empathy. But then I realized you can only do so much and to do it well. So what we're going to do is go a little bit deeper into em empathy and make some um, connections with the other um, important aspects of our um, our embodiedness that are found through the psychosocial sciences relating, relating to friendship. And so I do f I've kept friendship and I've kept um, happiness included more clearly, empathy. And um, as I was saying, the focus will be a dialogue, Aquinas um, and psychosocial research on friendship, love, and empathy. Um, it is a start, if you will, of a new research project, of a continuing research project that's also somewhat new in which um, there is uh, this, this um, connection between Aquinas' thought, which represents for us today a classic understanding of love, charity, and friendship, along with the psychosocial theory and mental health practice that contribute reflections on the concept, phenomena, and practice of empathy. Of course, love has a large um, range of considerations, which is wider than friendship and wider than empathy, per se, and our focus seeks to enlighten rather than to exhaust a treatment of the development of friendship, love, and empathy. What is empathy? Empathy can be understood as an interpersonal capacity to be receptive to and aware of the experience of another person while communicating this attunement to the other person. Empathy is conceived as cognitive, emotional, and interpersonal phenomena that serve as a basis for strengthened relationships and interactions. It can also be seen as a clinical practice or skill that can bring about healing and psychopathology, healing of psychopathology. And this is one of the reasons why I've latched on and gone deeper into empathy because it, it is so close um, to friendship and in the psychosocial sciences, um, in the psychotherapeutic um, um, applications, we see that empathy is, is one of the best, ver well, it's most widely um, empirically validated um, evidence-based practice, and it leads to, to healing. So how might this um, practices, how might an understanding and practices of empathy which lead towards healing give us an insight into friendship, and how might friendship at a theological and philosophical level give us an insight into the psychosocial sciences on empathy? I'm looking to go back and forth, seeing that there is a different levels and contribution that can be made from the psychosocial psycho sciences. And um, from the theological um, perspective. And so um, what I'd like to do is say, uh, is to recognize that there are, um, within this perspective, perhaps a, a rightfully, uh, the need for some provisos. The first one is that um, the paper focuses on friendship love, and it doesn't give full attentiveness to the types of details that we heard about Augustine or the specifications of courtship friendships, or spousal friendships, or filial love, or sibling friendships, or neighbor um, friendships, um, and if you will, love, charity, and friendships in other vocations, or even the terms like eros or complacency. Our focus is more, it's tighter, even though it does apply to these other, if you will, manifestations of friendship. Proviso two, um, Aquinas is a 13th century Dominican, specialist or master in virtue theory. And so Aquinas, so just a couple words about him, but he does bring with him a type of dialogue, his interest in the Christian scriptures and patristic sources and um, the Christian tradition. Um, and in, he brings it into a, a dialogue, if you will, engaging philosophy in his times and science of his times, um, as you all might know even better than I. With the current renewal of virtue theory, before and beyond positive psychology's use of virtues, Aquinas has become more widely known 
um, than ever, perhaps. And I will call upon him without giving you a full introduction to his thought. Um, his way of asking questions and including diverse dialogue partners makes him a model and mentor for our topic on the development of friendship love. Proviso three, I'll be using mostly the term flourishing instead of happiness. Happiness was used for the conference title. I prefer um, flourishing without denying the, the utility of happiness, which has been used quite often to translate beatitudo and other very rich concepts that go beyond the English, um, English happiness, which the root of which is hap, chance, luck. Not really what we're looking for in the kind of extended types of flourishing, but nonetheless a, a good placeholder and flourishing, um, I think, is, is, well, flourishing is what I will use to talk about this wife. Also, proviso four in our talk, I'll be using the term charity. And charity, we, we need to recognize, is not the charity of giving to the poor on the street. Um, that is a manifestation of a deeper notion of charity that we call, um, if you will, the theological virtue. Enough for provisos. This paper is rather focused. And it focuses on three questions, and you have them on the handout. First, how does Aquinas understand charity, divine love, as friendship with God, in terms of mutual benevolence and sharing with another's own good or sharing in one's flourishing? Secondly, how does the natural love of other people, a natural law, friendship love, employ associated skills to grow in knowledge and love of another person? Thirdly, um, how might empathy and other phenomena and mental health practices serve in promoting the development of the flourishing of friends? And so um, these three questions deal with the theology, the philosophical anthropology, and the so psychosocial sciences. First of all, how does Aquinas' understanding of charity as friendship with God in terms of mutual benevolence and sharing one's own good and flourishing with another person, um, how does he do that? Aquinas' um, thought offers a large, if you will, and deep context for discussions of love, friendship, and flourishing. In his Summa Theologica, his Summary of Theology, what we have is um, an exhaustive, um, after his exhaustive, if you will, or rather extensive treatment of God and creation and of anthropology, human anthropology, Aquinas addresses the human capacities to love God, neighbor, and self. And these capacities are developed through virtues, which we call, um, habits which we call virtues. Aquinas starts his in-depth treatment of the virtues and um, his treatment uh, of the virtues with the theological virtues. He treats faith, hope, and love first. Very interesting, anthropology is laid down, vision of God is laid down, and then when he starts treating the virtues, what does he do first? Well, he treats faith, hope, and love first in that order. Um, and what that does um, is we, we gives us reason to, to recognize how he is laying out um, a very Paul, Pauline notion following um, Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And he lays out his understanding of the human person by nature and by grace, by knowledge and by love, with a metaphysical and an anthropological basis for his theological reflections on the greatest of those virtues, which is love. What is um, friendship charity for Aquinas? Um, for Aquinas, the most perfect charity requires um, self-gift, the gift of one's own life. He draws on the Gospel of John's um, chapter 15, 13, um, insight, uh, the words of Jesus, quote, greater love has no one than this, that one lay down one's life for one's friends, end quote. One lays down one's life for one's friend. Sometimes we look for our Aquinas, where is he talking about self-gift? This is where he finds it, of course, in this notion of Jesus giving his life for his friends. And Aquinas summarizes this John 9 teaching um, by affirming that charity, this divine love, charity is friendship. For Aquinas, that's the sum, that's the first, that's the starting point, that's the bedrock um, and for him, the moral life is so concrete that his first definition of the virtue of charity is not academic, but interpersonal. It is, uh, and we are, if you will, set face to face with a friend. And Aquinas recognizes in his treatment of the Passion and Crucifixion, in his treatment all throughout, um, 
the theology of his theology of, of love, that Christ is the model of charity. He gives his very life for the good, the flourishing of his friends. Now, following Aquinas' lead and assuming this larger context, I start by addressing the moral and theological significance of the friend or friendship or friendliness in the thought of Aquinas on love and flourishing. Friendship is a type of love that varies according to its object. Very important point here, this is also the issues related to misunderstandings about who's loved and how we can love God and neighbor. Um, there are significant differences when God is the object of love and when it is our neighbor or spouse or child or parent or even a stranger unknown to us in very different ways. In general, um, friendship love is the interpersonal actualization of this flourishing life of friends. For Aquinas, it is the ability to be God's friend rather than his slave. This is the basic, this is the nature, this is the bedrock for his development of what psychology or what is um, theological charity, that there is a natural foundation and it is the foundation of the potentiality of, to be a friend, not a slave. Um, that's the natural ground or potential that is elevated by grace and charity and the infused and in spiritual virtues. Friendship is this natural good that human reason, supported and made possible by God's help, this auxilia day that underlies all of creation, um, it shapes, um, it is this natural good of reason that shapes for human life projects um, the way that we can understand how um, a love is manifest on a natural level. Friendship is also an infused good that divine reason and love shapes and perfects for divine projects through grace. It is in the mode of salvation that we see the fuller um, elevated reality of this friendship um, of, with God as, yeah, this friendship with God. Now there are several major characteristics of this friendship love for Aquinas, and I'd like to regroup together Aquinas' insights into two large areas. The first one being that, um, that love involves, if you will, the mutual well-wishing between friends. Benevolence is, is classic, we understand the classic notion of benevolence um, in love. But for Aquinas, it's not just benevolence, it's mutual benevolence, and mutual benevolence that is recognized by another. And each of those steps, in one sense, makes it more and more complete, more and more dynamic. That is, um, for us, um, something that um, tells us about this friendship love with God. But it's not, it's not only benevolence, um, but it, all, it involves also the communication of and sharing in the goodness of the friend communication of, not just verbally, but this way that um, only God can share um, the good of his own being um, with another. And so we have benevolence and this communicatio of goods, that is, that are two real ways of regrouping Aquinas' understanding of, of friendship love and all, different, all of its different manifestations at a theological level. Um, that then gets played out at the natural level as well, including in our understanding of empathy, I would say. The, the good of, um, the giving of goods, this aspect of, of self-gift for Aquinas, the second aspect of, of, of charity love, involves this communication um, of the gift of self to the friend. And it is, for Aquinas, the model of friendship. In his theological reflections, he identifies um, that the preeminent self-giving friend is Christ, who is the friend that gives himself, who is the model, who is the exemplar. It is Christ who gives his life as a good to be shared with his friends. In sharing such goods, he becomes the model for all virtues, quote, of obedience, humility, constancy, justice, and the other virtues displayed in the passion, which are requisite for salvation, end of quote, Aquinas, of course. We, we have begun with these theological considerations of love, even though since grace perfects nature, there are reasons for addressing nature and the nature of emotional love and volitional love before grace. Nonetheless, a theological approach evokes the ultimate end of love, friendship, and flourishing. And a theological start allows us to identify that charity's love, um, charity love's object is God primarily and its secondary object is other people and self. 
the way that this gets played out for Aquinas, of course, is that uh, the, the two levels of object, one primary, one transcendent, and the other natural, in one sense, relate to each other as source to fulfillment and don't uh, conflict, but rather, um, in, in a very uh, complex description, um, complement and serve, um, serve each other. I, um, it has been. It also helps us um, to identify the need for an account of the infused virtues. That is, an account of how charity is the basis for the much-needed infused moral virtues, natural virtues, justice and um, courage, and and um, temperance, are perfected um, in various ways, lifted up um, by the the life of grace by God's. Um, working through his love in men and women. And um, these infused virtues, um, the way that God infuses di um, a dynamic that changes the way that we are just and the way that we're temperate, involves, if you will, principally moving us um, and um, contextualizing us in, in a life that seeks um, salvation. The infused virtues are about salvation. The natural virtues are about our living our lives with others in ways, nonetheless, that are flourishing and bring about a type of flourishing that satisfies. But there's always going to be something more that's answered in the infused moral virtues. In, in, our, in a sentimentalist type of culture, um, love doesn't always have the meaning discussed um, above. To understand the breadth of love and friendship in Aquinas' philosophical psychology or philosophy of nature with the faculties of the soul, we need to present um, four basic characteristics of the body-soul unity, um, the sensory perception and intellect, the motion and the volition um, in terms of love in order to understand the larger picture of love for Aquinas. Um, in order to flourish, natural love um, aims to be united to a good, by emotion, by desire, um, by the very way that we move forward and are attracted to the good, by sensory appetite and, uh, or affect, and by will, not only emotion, but by will and volition, the intellectual ap affect and appetite. Now, natural love can't be explained by itself. This is my whole point of this second natural section. It needs to be explained in terms of a type of knowledge that precedes it. We don't love what we don't know. And the knowing that underlies emotion and will is the sensory perceptual cognitions, which are so important for understanding empathy and, um, and reason, which helps us to see the big picture. Aquinas's approach distinguishes charity from love um, in, in various ways. He designates the natural basis of charity by this term, love. We can cut, um, translate it as love by recognizing the will's natural capacity for love. Um, and in so doing, he distinguishes charity from other types of love and involves the will. Um, what makes the difference is the involvement, not just of emotion, but of will. For there is the volitional love and benevolence and self-giving that underlies virtues such as justice and courage and temperance and patience and perseverance, and all of them are enlivened um, because of the capacity not just to to be emotive, to be attracted, and to be um, well, well groomed, if you will, ethically and virtuously, but to recognize there is by, by the will and by the intellect a raising up and a perfecting that is um, only, um, only possible when we see anthropologically the capacities of knowing and loving, not just at intellectual levels, but the knowing and loving at the embodied um, levels of sense and perception and emotion. Now, what is friendship love? Um, friendship love, in the midst of establishing a theological foundation and authority about friendship love based on the Gospel of John, as we saw, um, Aquinas turns also to a philosophical authority. He establishes the, the theological authority. John sets the tone. The philosophical authority is Aristotle, and he pre presents, if you will, another um, reality another aspect, another fuller aspect of the person, um, the capacity for love, um, friendship, love in particular. And he identifies classically, well known, and I'm not going, going into it too much, but um, it's important to mark out that Aristotle's understanding of friendship 
um, has this threefold analysis where there is the friendship of, of pleasure. It dies as soon as pleasure dies. There is the friendship of utility. It will stop also when the usefulness of the friendship um, is over. And there is this um, friendship, if you will, of virtue, um, of the good life shared together. That is the heart of understanding um, where is the lasting element. And Aristotle says that perfect friendship, that lasting element of friendship, is the friendship of people who are good and alike in virtue. And uh, for these wish well alike, this is a quote, to each other as good, and they are good in themselves, end of quote. Uh, it is uh, through a distinction of nature and grace. And so what I like to do is um, just identify within Aristotle's understanding that we have also a foundational element that Aquinas picks up, and it's this, the reality that perfect friends involve a common life of virtue, of wishing well of each other, and of, if, if you will, the participation in their, um, their love, um, a, t a type of love. It is through a distinction of nature and grace that Aquinas gives a reason to further distinguish um, by grace the natural friendship love from friendship charity. And this is something that just as a convention that I understand what's happening in Aquinas' thought. Um, he recognizes three things. The, the natural um, emotion of love, the, the, the richer um, will-empowered friendship love, and the charity-empowered friendship charity. So I'm going to say love as emotion, let's say love, um, friendship love as that will, will love that involves a friendship that engages um, the goodness, the desiring of goodness for the other, and then the charity um, friendship, the, or the friendship charity that we saw up front. Um, and it's in this um, understanding that Aquinas can account for various types and levels of knowing and loving. And it's a philosophical project that he makes, and I think it's very helpful for us to understand the place of friendship um, at these different levels and the way that friendship can be, be drawn, if you will, um, forward um, in contact with, with other people. Um, in one sense, what I'd like to do is maybe um, not go too much further into the anthropology um, that has been set out largely um, for, of Aquinas in order to focus more on the side of empathy and how empathy might feed us in some way to understand more, um, more profoundly the reality of, um, of, of friendship love. Um, the distinct, first, um, another distinction, this, this, this distinction between natural loves, friendship love, or love of desire, this love of emotion, um, can be understood to give us a, some, something of a natural underlying um, reality that is the nature on which grace transforms the life of the person. God doesn't, in Aquinas' mindset, transform the person um, in, in, like an angel. He does to talk about the, the way that grace, um, that nature is perfected by grace according to the mode of nature. This is probably the most important insight throughout, um, throughout this paper and throughout any kind of bridging to the psychosocial sciences, that there is um, this, that when we're talking about how God's grace transforms nature, it's by the mode of nature. It's not by the mode uh, um, that is foreign to the capacities that are already built into the very nature of the person as created in God's image and likeness. There's the fall, but at the same time there is the, the capacity um, to be raised up. The grace, the grace perfects nature according to human nature. And so the, the normative and the, the metaphysical reality of grace um, working through nature is an important part of understanding in one sense how a dialogue with the psycholo psychological sciences can say anything philosophically significant um, for friendship, love, or, and friendship, charity. So the third part now, I'd like to enter into the discussion of, of empathy. 
and how empathy and other mental health um, practices can serve in promoting, in one sense, the, the development of friendship and the development of flourishing. So let's focus for a moment on the nature and phenomena and practices of empathy in um, interpersonal relationships, drawing on mental health studies. And it's in that context we're going to come back to Aquinas and see how this kind of insights into nature, because when we're talking about the psychosocial understanding of the person, we're talking about the nature of the person. So once we have some insight from empathy studies, the question will be, how does that relate then to the a classic um, tradition, the classic tradition as being represented by Aquinas concerning the way um, that we can understand friendship. So let's talk about empathy. There are many different definitions of empathy. And the concept of empathy um, is being used in different fields in, in evolutionary psychology, in neurosciences, in psychotherapy, in arts, uh, art appreciation, and in ethics. And it's being used to explore the interpersonal emotive experiences that we have. For our purposes here, we will note certain characteristics induced and drawn from the definitions, observations, and practices of empathy in the psychosocial field, focusing on certain aspects of love to con contextualize and conceptualize, if you will, curative practices related to empathy. First, a little history. In 1909, it was Kitsch Kitschler that translated the term empathy from Einfühlung, in feeling or to suffer, um, in his lectures on the experimental psycho psychological thought processes. However, it was in the 30s and 40s, the late 30s and 40s, that Carl Rogers more pop popularized more um, the concept of pract and practice of empathy in his person-centered psychotherapy. Also in psychology in 1949, Diamond defined empathy as the, the imag quote, the imaginative transposing of oneself into the thinking, feeling, and acting of another, and so structuring the world as he does, end of quote. Other representatives of the wide-ranging literature on, on empathy ask questions such as, is empathy an attitude or, or behavior? Is it a felt knowledge of another person's emotional experience, or is empathy an interpretive process of, of understanding the mind? Terms that are used um, quasi, um, quasi um, synonymously in the study of empathy include unconditional acceptance, sympathy, compassion, fellow feeling, prosocial emotions, altruism, and insight, which in one sense show a diversity of understanding and a reason why we need to be careful about um, interpreting um, in our interpretations of studies of empathy. The neurosciences also have identified the neural correlates of empathy, which are fascinating, and understood as the capacity to experience neurologically someone else's pain or joy without physical pain that is proper to the self, um, but only because of the perceived pain of another, one's neural circuits of pain are activated. This is a basis for understanding something more of the relationship, the first relationships, and the first types of contacts that friends might um, make. Empathy is that, in, in, in the neuroscience perspective, empathy is the internal neural mirroring of the other person's experience. And through em empathy, one is influenced cognitively and effectively by the example of the other person who can serve as a mentor or exemplar. So it's explaining some of the foundational elements of ethics, of um, a vision of the person. And um, these, neuro, these, neuro, so these neuroscience um, in indicators are extremely interesting. And so the opening of, of empathy um, that one more easily enters into alliances and interpersonal relationships, in short, empathy empowers attachments, according to the neuroscientists. Researchers have shown that uh, mere neurons underlie such sharing of emotions, and including the sharing of soothing emotions in the face of fear or anger, and so on. From an uh, evolutionary perspective, now, uh, just an insight, empathy is conceived as useful for humans since to know each other's pain, suffering, and needs 
leads to the survival of the species. It leads also to the extension of mutual aid, and it leads to the reduction of stress. Interesting um, insights from psychological, um, well, from evolutionary psychology. These, are, of course, are insights into, uh, at a theoretical level, um, the, the utility for the race of empathy. Furthermore, it's common to distinguish three types of empathy. And they involve um, the emotive, the cognitive, and the behavioral. Um, the emotive um, empathy is, in emotive empathy, one feels um, the other person's emotions, the other person's feeling and the, about the self and about others. And that is at another level than the cognitive empathy that we're where one perceives another person's mind or soul, thoughts about the self, thoughts about the other. And um, emotive, cognitive, third, behavioral empathy is one that motivates one to act. And sometimes empathy that's motivated to act is no longer seen as empathy as the one that enters into the experience of the other, but the one that steps in and pulls someone out of their experience. And so a nuance is given sometimes um, in the terms of the behavioral empathy to be more sympathy or compassion in an active form. Such behavioral empathy um, offers attention and care and also forms types of alliances, bonds, and friendships. At these three levels, we can emphasize, for instance, with, we can empathize, for example, with the person who's suffering um, because they've lost a spouse. There can, be, um, there can be the empathy at these different levels, the, the, the feeling, the knowing, or the doing. Or likewise, we can empathize with the joy that a person experiences because they've been married or they have a new child. This experience, um, the studies have shown that um, in expressing these types of empathy, the giver of empathy and the receiver of empathy may experience an opportunity to enrich interpersonal relationship. And this experience can aid in the formation of strengthening or strengthening of a psychotherapeutic alliance. Um, the gift of empathy, the person who gives their attention and openness, extends to the neighbor, not only um, um, extended to the neighbor, may also open the possibility to develop friendship among neighbors. Empirical studies um, have shown that there are these three aspects, the three modalities of empathy, the therapeutic or the gift empathy, the one that is attentive to the other. And it's at this level where we find the empirical study indicating that there, there is, um, in clinical contexts, um, a type of therapist empathy, quote, that is moderately strong, a moderately strong predictor of therapeutic outcome, end of quote. When the re this is one of the reasons I was saying why uh, I need to go deeper into empathy to recognize how um, the philosophical understanding of, of, um, of friendship might be um, operative in terms of the psychotherapeutic. The psychotherapeutic having this um, reality of, of being curative and this um, tenacity in studying what is thought to be curative have found across the different modalities of psychotherapeutic use, CB, cognitive behavioral therapy, object relations, emotion-focused therapy and the like, um, the various evidence-based practices of empathy have shown to be predictors of, of, um, of healing, moderately strong factor in healing. Studies have also shown, on the contrary, that com com uncompassionate care and a lack of therapist empathy results in patients who are dissatisfied with treatment and who have worse outcomes because they do not comply with treatment. And so, Round, maybe just identifying some of the, the across the board um, important aspects of empathy. I we can list that um, with a certain focus on the psychotherapeutic, that there is empathy that allow, uh, empathy allows us to perceive another's emotions, first key element. Um, empathy can serve as an emotional bridge between people. It's not just feeling the emotion of the other, but there's the bridging that happens where the other perceives you're being perceived, perceives you're being um, experienced, see, perceive that you're being understood. Thirdly, it can lead to helping 
to helping and pro-social behavior between persons in need, it moves to action. You're taken out of yourself with empathy, and then there are other steps. Um, it can lead to action. Empathy can lead to new relationships, including the therapeutic relationship, which is formed in large part by the empathetic um, atten attention to the other. Empathy can lead um, not just to this, uh, ther the therapeutic relationship, it can promote um, different types of attachment. It's in that context that we, it's in that context that we can say that empathy also can lead then not just to psychotherapeutic relationships but to friendships. It is the foundation that leads towards the development of friendships. Empathetic med medical care has um, more positive outcomes also, such as improved parent improved patient um, experiences, quote, um, adherence to treatment recommendations, better clinical outcomes, fewer medical errors, and malpractice claims, interesting for the therapists and the clinicians and the physicists and the physicians, and actually also higher phys um, physician retention, end of quote. Empathetic psychotherapy can lead to the healing of psychopathology, um, as I mentioned in as much as it is an aspect of evidence-based practices that have identified um, the reality of, um, of empathy. What, um, so in the midst of this mini-study of empathy, the question then is, um, how, can we, uh, how can we take into consideration um, our first, if you will, o overview of the theological and the philosophical sources about the development of friendship and this, if you will, positive um, pro-social outcomes from empathy. Um, and so the questions that, that will lead us to a conclusion um, involves um, what is the origin of empathy's efficacy? Why do we think, um, what, how can we understand there to be um, positive results out of the experience of empathy? And might these findings and related insights be extended to non-clinical um, experiences of empathy. And so um, as, um, as I might have mentioned at the beginning, I work with clinicians, I work with psychotherapists and a philosopher theologian that lays down one sense of anthropology um, that goes back and forth and it involves a type of dialogue. Um, and this is the example of the type of dialogue. Um, this mini study um, helps us, if you will, to of, the, of, emo of empathy helps us to have um, a foundation for considerations of, of, the, of the dynamic of empathy. One of my basic theses about, uh, about um, empathy and friendship love is that empathy is a receptive aspect of love. So in one sense, when we're looking to the dynamic of, of empathy, the first um, psychotherapeutic um, interest is at that level that we're, um, there's the openness to the other. And the openness to the other that is in one sense um, an openness to the person of the other as being expressed by their emotions, as being expressed by their thoughts, as being seen within their, their actions. And if, if it is a, f a first receptivity to that level of love, um, attraction towards the good, then we can understand something, something more that in helps us, if you will, be open to relationships of love. Um, and it involves, if you will, um, a first cognitive aspect of love. The emotion is rooted in a knowing. The knowing is prior to, if you will, the emotion. Um, and Aquinas' um, anthropology helps us, if you will, to take into consideration empathy that is not simply an openness um, to love, but also the first step of some kind of movement, attraction towards the other as good. Now within the philosophical anthropology of, of, of um, Aquinas, we see the whole range of the sensory perceptions. And you have the, the sensory perceptional cognitive, cognitive aspect that in, of the person that allows us to understand something sometimes that philosophically we, we set aside. We focus on reason and will, and we don't focus on the embodied. Empathy helps us um, to, to understand something of that, but Aquinas allows us to understand something of it, and in one sense pushes us back, 
pushes us back into the, the experience of empathy, recognizing that there must be at the very beginning of the experience of empathy some kind of attraction, repulsion, and uh, Aquinas speaks about this in terms of the evaluative sense. Um, in one sense, when we're looking at the, the insights into empathy, we're seeing an evaluative sense operative within the person. I kind of, I'm trying to point to the feeling, I'm trying to point to a center point. Uh, we, we experience um, the other as dangerous. We experience the other as, as safe. We experience the other as a possible friend. Um, cl um, clinical indications are that this is what empathy is about. But also philosophically speaking, this is what we understand to be the basis of an embodied aspect of knowing that we call, um, uh, that in, in psychological terms we can talk about in terms of perception, and in philosophical terms we can talk about uh, types of memory, imagination, and um, the, the, the evaluative sense. And so um, another basic tenet um, that, I, that I've been working on here is to try to understand how well, uh, to understand that empathy is curative and why it is. And I think it is curative in as much as it expresses a dimension of true friendship. The, the philosophical tr um, tradition identifies there's this first pre-emotional type of reality in the midst of an encounter and the other person in one sense existentially is understood and felt and that is very common in, an in animals at an instinctual level. But also it's at the heart of a human experience. In various ways, it's not simply animal-like because it is taken up in the, in, the, in the what happens afterwards and how we live what is being perceived. And the what happens afterwards and what we're living and what, how we perceive um, and how we understand what we're experiencing, um, I think is curative because it is actually something that we're deeply structured to do. We're deeply structured to connect with the other people, another person, but it doesn't happen by itself. These studies on empathy help us to understand something of the dynamic of the, th the therapeutic gift empathy compared to the reception mm -hmm. type of empathy. And that explains, in one sense, a very deep level of how God has structured us with inclinations and capacities that allow us then to, be, um, to, to complete um, our vocations by extending um, not just perception purely as being attending towards friendliness, but there being then the emotional life that's, that, that is taken into consideration, that is taken into consideration within the context of one's vocation, that one is mother, one is father, one is wife, one is husband, one is called in various ways to love. And so the, the basic attraction towards the other or the repulsion from the other um, involves um, the ways that afterwards we have to shape our lives our, and our life is shaped in the confessions of Augustine in a very um, floral, uh, very powerfully um, um, insightful um, way. But under, anthropologically underneath it, we can understand that some, what's happening there is that the goodwill, Aquinas' understanding of, um, of the person in, in love, in love with God, involves um, something that it's perfective of the person. There's a perfection, a perfection, a perfecting, a transforming of something that's deep within us. We're attracted to, and the, these natural inclinations of being attracted to the good of the other and being friendly allows us then to further steps that, that involve a development of virtue, development of the virtue of friendship, which takes, if you will, the whole tr um, way that empathy is manifesting certain aspects of this pro-friendly, pro, -friendly, pro um, therapeutic union, pro-life um, um, in common perspective. And it involves um, also a communication of goods because we see within empathy in the curative aspect when the, the therapist actually then succeeds in being with and for and listening to the other and the relationship is formed and the therapeutic alliance is shaped we have then another step, another step for he healing that doesn't then end the work of empathy, but it's a, a process that moves forward. One question in this kind of um, affirmation of, of the importance of empathy in the psychotherapeutic is, um, and the, the whole question of friendship, 
this, um, it certainly involves what are the roles of friends and, and how can, in understanding more completely um, the, the neurophysiological and the deeply anthropological aspects of friend, friendly types of uh, empathy, how do they serve then in forming friendships, in forming not just, psycho- not just um, therapeutic alliances, but also the friendships um, that are significant for our lives. In conclusion, I have chosen to bring into dialogue the nature, phenomena, and practice of empathy because empathy is one of the several one of several foundations that seem to prepare for and aid in forming of relationships. It is a gateway to friendship without being friendship properly speaking. It might be said to be an associated skill or a psychological functional equivalent to an associated virtue related to friendship and charity as well as justice. We've discussed the several types of love and charity I've, and I suggested um, and I would suggest that the theological gift of charity as friendship with God invites an investigation of the nature that underlies the graced nature of charity. And Aquinas identifies two qualities of friendship charity, recognized um, recognize mutual benevolence and communication of goods or flourishing self-gift. They go together. Natural friendship love too requires benevolence and communication of self and the other associated virtues and functional mental health capacities that bolster friendship love needed as well. Insights that complete Aquinas's insights are the mental health Um, are that the mental health practices such as gift, empathy, attachment, forgiveness, and friendliness will give us even more insights into the nature of these deep, if you will, um, roots and inclinations towards friendship. The theological and anthropological insights of Aquinas, last word, um, makes friends and friendship central to understanding everyday flourishing and transcendent life. Empirical research and mental health considerations enrich this theological and philosophical understanding with their insights on empathy. From both sides, there are contributions. The theological dimension identifies the ends of flourishing in friendship and practices of, for benevolence and self-giving in accord with the nature of the person. Not just anything passes as benevolence or self-communication of good. Aquinas's normative understanding of the person in flourishing provide metaphysical and ethical ends and means to pursue the good and the particular goods of, the differ- diff- of different friends. Secondly, the psychosocial dimension of our discussion recognizes that empathy serves as a transformative practice, an applied or associated type of virtue, we could say, that underlies friendship and other pro-social virtues. And finally, it is our suggestion that we need to attend to both the acquired, natural, and theological grace levels of friendship for a wider understanding of the potential of interpersonal flourishing and the study and practice of empathy um, when, in terms of offering a window into the foundational um, sensory cognitive curative dimension of, of friendship. Thank you. Father? So, uh, I, uh, as I understood, you said that empathy leads to attachment. But I'm thinking of a different paradigm, which was explored by uh, my professor back in the 1980s, uh, Marshall Klaus. I and mean, he looked at the bonding between the mother and the infant, where uh, required, he found it required face to face attach, face to face looking, and even skin to skin contact with the first 10 to 15 minutes of, of life. And he found that he didn't talk about love or gravity, but he found that there was a certain number of physiological and psychological parameters that were improved over uh, those cases where they didn't have control. And so is there, does attachment lead to empathy or does empathy lead to attachment? This is a developmental question, and it's a very good question. In one sense, you, you can ask, um, in the very beginning, in the beginning, what is in the beginning? Um, in, the, in the very beginning, 
you have the, the child, the infant's capacity um, to, in one sense, express um, that, that attachment, the need for attachment, the reality of attachment is certainly there. And I, I think that we can say um, that there needs to be um, certainly attachment type behavior from the mother um, in order to elicit the, the, and this is I think the point, the, the initial types of contact with the, with the child um, it elicits the attachment or, or rather deepens it. There is already because of the voice of the mother, because of the presence of the mother, um, the attachment that the child experiences. And I think that in terms of the child, we have a special way of talking about the need, the reality of attachment and, um, and the way that attachment is manifest. And when we're talking about um, empathy, there, there is, I, I think, a developmental, we have, to, we have to see it in a developmental perspective because it does change very early in terms of how the child does, um, can, can be receptive. But I do believe that attachment is communicated. And empathy is a type of communication, sharing in. And the mother's presence to the child, the openness to the child, involves nonetheless first her love for the child. And so in one sense there I would say yes, um, certainly. Attachment is always going to be underlying and, 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 pre, um, and, and before fuller types of empathetic um, um, manifestations. But I, th I think you're bringing out the point that I would have loved to have pursued more fully, just how attachment itself also serves at this very deep level of the, the pre-discursive types of um, relation, relationality. Attachment as a secure attachment, for example, in attachment theory, it involves uh, the way that the individual, that individuals have experienced something. Attachment is born of experience. It's born of the experience with the mother it's, or the primary caregiver. And, uh, and so at a very deep level, I agree that attachment is significant. And um, before and after, I'd say, yes, it is there before um, and it is thereafter um, in different ways, according to development. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, empathy expresses a quality of friendship. Could you expand on the role of uh, Empathy and friendship with God. Good. So in, when we're talking about the development that, that comes out of empathy, um, empathy in one sense at a natural level uh, allows, or in one sense, draws us towards expressions, expressions of, of love. And the empathetic, exp um, if you will, capacity um, to, to receive from the other, in one sense, in one sense involves our being attentive to God's presence, being empathetic, that is being in, in, at one with God, open to God, open to receptivity with God. But on the other side, we, we, can, we can talk about love and um, love of God and empathy in terms of the way that God is the giver of empathy. And when we feel and recognize that God is listening to us, hearing us, being present to us, transforming us, that that also, in one sense, is empathy received. So when there is, um, and this, I think, is, is what, one of the key insights in, in psychopathology from a Christian perspective, when there is love that is communicated by the therapist or recognized as coming from God, there's a transformation that happens in the person. And so charity, um, who sources God is transformative when we do feel it. It's communicated by, from us to other people when, as much as we can communicate it. We can give the gift of empathy. So, good, good question. Much more to be said, I'm sure. So you discussed um, kind of empathy as the gateway for charity, but it seems to me that a certain amount of charity is necessary to the development of empathy. I'm curious how you would resolve that kind of apparent circularity those of us kind of higher than the bondage of self-love, we don't know where to start. Great, great question. We, in the beginning, it was, there was this empathetic gift that was given and received Adam and Eve, a, a paradigm that we can't return to. 
Um, but there is the redemption that offers us, if you will, a new understanding of how there can be um, an empathetic presence to the other, even in the midst of, of lacking the fullness ourselves, the fullness of virtue. Um, I, I think that when we're talking about um, the chicken and the egg, um, empathy as a natural capacity of the person to be drawn towards what is good and identification of the other as a potential friend is a natural aspect that is, uh, that is part of nature that's transformed by grace. So what came first? Well, nature came first. Um, grace nature comes with the redemption and it is according to our, if you will, receptivity of that, God's gifting, God's giving to us of grace that there is the transformation of um, being friendly into being friends. When, we, when we're talking about empathy, we're talking about this natural type of being drawn towards um, a type of friendliness. Now, quite I mean, one translation of the Summa's um, discussion of friendship and justice, the natural level, I, um, translates um, friendship as friendliness. But if I can distinguish for a minute friendliness as that first kind of in, in inclination, there is by nature a friendliness that's marked by the disorder of the fall, social sin, or impersonal sin. But um, it, when, in knowing that, I think nonetheless it's significant to, um, to, to understand the person in terms of the deeper reality. What's the deeper reality? I think the deeper reality is that the wounding that happens in sin is not the last word there's redemption, but also um, a Catholic Christian perception of the reality is that what's deepest is still God's image and likeness within the person even after the fall. And that involves the level of those deep inclinations. And the deep inclinations that's manifest in empathy of friendliness can be marked in various ways by sin, can be marked in various ways by trauma. And the therapist in various ways is going to in one sense, try to untie the knots of the natural inclinations towards friendliness, um, what the spiritual director will do in different ways, and the pastoral work will do um, in other ways as well. There's a question I just want to answer um, that was asked last night, and I said I was going to answer it today, and I skipped over that part of my text. And that involves the way that um, when we were talking about this movement towards friendliness and the way that the psychotherapist can use it or does use it, there is uh, nonetheless, I think, a, the need to recognize um, that when we're talking about a growth in friendliness in the context of the psychotherapeutic type of alliance, we're not talking about this, the, the therapeutic alliance as being a friendship like other friendships. Friends, there are different friendships different types of friendships. I tried to identify something of that even by saying I'm not going to deal with all the types of friendships involved in the spousal friendship and the, the, the siblings friendship, the, the friendships at work. Um, there, there's a special friendship that is psychotherapeutic that builds nonetheless from these realities of being drawn towards being friends, but there is a parameter. But that is it's not unique to the, the therapist who has a parameter that, that it can't, you can't extend friendship outside of the barriers of the clinic. In one sense, that's to protect. And it is, in one sense, also the result of a code of conduct that is um, corrected against errors and abuses. But every friendship is limited, except for God's. God's friendship is, is communication of himself, um, and his self, and, and that is the flourishing that comes out of friendship. It is God's self-gift. But every other type of friendship is circumscribed by the virtues that one has, and by the relationships and, and vocations that one has. Um, the, the, the child to the mother, the mother to the child, indicates a type of, I'm going to say, a type of friend, friendliness, a type of connectivity, where one is ready to not, uh, use, using Aquinas as two groups, if you will, of insights into friendship, one is ready to give of oneself for the other, one is willing to share the communion, in communion, in communication, the good, with the other, um, but then also the, the benevolence. In those two realities, the benevolence of friendship and the sharing communication of the goods of friendship, we have two um, 
two indicators that you can't understand unless you put it in the context of vocation. So it's the mother who understands the benevolence and, and, and the sharing of goods as a mother can. She, o she alone can give certain things. She can alone will certain goodnesses for the child. And that's the special nature of the mother vocation in terms of friendship. The father likewise, colleagues likewise. Um, and so just an example that the Therapeutic Alliance is, a, is an example of a limitation within friendship, but there's, all of us have um, limitations. Um, and my spousal limitations puts parameters around myself in terms of my relationship with everyone, everyone else. That's not, a, that's not a belittling of my friendship, but it's actually an expansion of the quality that can be made, the quality of friends that can be had. Um, yeah. Yeah, I like, I like what you said about um, the aspect of empathy as a, uh, as a, a movement or attraction towards uh, a knowledge of the good. Um, what, if the, um, what if the therapist doesn't have a, uh, a knowledge of the right ordering of, of goods? Um, is it possible for that therapist to, uh, to be empathetic? Empathy can be taught, but it's taught within the context of, of an actual person's experiences. And so for the person, the therapist who has experienced trauma, and perhaps difficulty in their own lives, there's going to be, those will more mark in various ways the extension of um, empathy to another. Uh, my, and so there is, by the nature of the human person, I think a, a calling um, to empathize and, and to receive empathy but um, it's clear that um, this is a this is empathy and the capacity to empathy and to, to empathize is one of the um, basic elements of what determines whether you're going to make it through a clinical program or not it's one, this is one of the first things that people are, are experience in good clinical programs is some kind of um, encounter with clinicians and forming first co courses to help them recognize whether there is the natural empathetic capacity that, that is in, a, in such a state that can be, can be nurtured into a, a therapeutic um, person, a therapeutic professional. Not everyone can do that. And why is that? Um, there, there are reasons, including that, for example, there are certain, um, certain people are better at cognitive empathy and certain other people are better at um, emotional empathy and I would say that none of us, well it's very rare that someone would be completely deficient in, in one um, or both but there needs to be at least some kind of balance and there sometimes is a deficiency in the emotional to a point where the psychologist, um, you can't be a psychologist, you can't be a, a, a therapist in the same way as, as, as you would otherwise. You, you can do testing, Ink blood tests, um, Rorschach tests, and the like. But. How do we conceive of uh, attachment in the context of Christian attachment or vice versa? Can you repeat that? Yeah, I, I didn't catch that. How do we uh, conceive? How do we understand um, attachment in the context of Christian detachment okay. or vice versa? Good. So, I mean, Christian detach. Oh, good. So, how can you understand? Attachment it wasn't empathy; it was attachment. In terms of in terms of um, Christian detachment, I, I think the attachment and attachment theory helps us to understand something very basic about the human person and our needs for the other. Um, the needs for the other and the way that we're formed by the other in love. A secure attachment involves the way that the mother, the primary caregiver has enabled within the child a secure um, relationship to the world. Can move out, explore, can come back to a safe haven, and um, that kind of attachment is a good thing. A Christian detachment would involve, in one sense, um, in as much as it's balanced and virtuous, actually really working um, in terms of love of God and, and others, um, it would involve a detachment from what is disordered. I think a Christian detachment is a, a separation from what is disordered. 
And the disordering um, needs to be seen in the context of vocation, um, a Christian notion of detachment from my child, who's now three months old, because I'm Christian, I'm called to leave her with someone else or not be in care. I mean, there's the, the weird kinds of things that one might think that, think that Christians think, but Christians don't think that. A, 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 a holy detachment involves the type of right ordering and, if you will, the types of limited detachments, because one is never completely detachment, detached um, from the loves that, that are ours according to vocations. St. John of the Cross is very good at the nada and embracing, in one sense, the, the separation from the goods in the context of, of course, the union with God in a very deep way. And so, um, thank you. So, um, much like empathy, altruism is evolutionarily positive, meaning that the practice of altruism encourages the survival of the species. So, but what's interesting in that, in that literature is that it doesn't actually matter what motivates you to be altruistic, whether it be theological or ethical principles or even uh, selfish needs. Um, and so, taking that <coughs> into account, I'm kind of wondering whether the emotive and cognitive forms of empathy are not then precursors to the behavioral. So, if you don't get to the actual output, does it matter? Well, in one sense, the, um, the whole understanding of friendship um, in the Christian sense involves the wholeness that we're talking about, that you're talking about. Not just the behavior of following Christ and all that that means in terms of relating to other people and giving one's life for the other people, but also preceding that, the knowing what we're doing and, if you will, the feeling about what we're doing in the right way. I mean, Aristotle has some insights there that the fullness of virtue will involve them all together. Aquinas follows that, and I think a Christian perspective is like, likewise would take a look at the empathetic, the studies of empathy, and saying, this is what's interesting about empathy. Empathy can help us realize the details of how there is a relationship between the emotional and the cognitive and the behavioral. And in the psychopathology, what we have is the various ways where the, the behavioral is deformed because of trauma or distortions. The trauma that affects emotions or distortions that affect cognitions. And, and so it, it's in the, the, in one sense, the psychology of, of psychology, the, the science of psychology. It helps us to understand something more about how that happens and how to undo it. The pastoral workers and the spiritual, and spiritual advisors have insights also about what that means when the when there isn't the emotive or the, um, empathy and there isn't the cognitive empathy and there isn't the behavioral empathy. From the different perspectives according to the different relationships and different vocations, you have all those elements that are necessary. But the psychological sciences help us to understand what sometimes when it's not going right and how to how to fix that. Thank you.